Hello, my name is Anthony Fogg and I work for a company called Seismic Image Processing Limited. I'm a geophysicist and my interests are specifically AVO, rock physics and seismic inversion and today I'm going to talk to you about applied AVO. This is a small subsection of a much larger course so we teach this as a one-day course through the EAGE or directly from our company and in that one-day course we cover a variety of different items. For example, the background on AVO and why do we use it, its history, how you can apply it, qualitative methods and then more importantly these days calibrated methods through a process known as seismic inversion. We also look at rock physics, synthetics and resolution issues where a thin bed may or may not be a problem for you in analysing your data for AVO characteristics. And then we look at anisotropy, processing and seismic migration. These are key things to consider if you're going to get a good quality AVO product out. And if you're interested in land data or OBC, we start to look at shear wave AVO and azimuthal AVO, which is used for imaging fractures. And we finish off the full one day course with a comprehensive series of case studies. But today, I'm just going to talk about a few small elements to this. Now the equation you see in front of you is the simplest form of reflectivity. This is for vertical rays. So if I was to drop a ball onto the floor and see it bounce, it would bounce back with a certain amount of height, a certain amount of elasticity. And it's the same for acoustic waves. So if we send a pulse into the ground, it reflects back to us with a certain amplitude. And that amplitude is dependent on that equation. It is the difference in the acoustic impedance, density times velocity, of the two interfaces above and below the layer divided by their sum. Now that equation is only valid for vertical rays and if we send a P wave pulse into the ground it comes back as a P wave pulse. But we very rarely record vertical rays. This is actually what happens in the real earth when we do a seismic experiment. What you see now is an incident wavelet hitting an interface at an oblique angle. And when a wavelet hits a boundary at an oblique angle, it often exhibits something called energy partitioning. So we end up with two different types of waveforms being generated. The P wave, which is similar to the one that was sent down into the Earth. But we then get something which is mode converted, a shear wave. And we can vertically polarized or horizontally polarized shear waves. But that's the important point that we want to look at with AVO analysis how much mode conversion has taken place. Now this energy partitioning is angle dependent. So it's dependent on the angle of incidence of that ray path onto the interface and how it's then reflected. So in fact, when we talk about amplitude versus offset analysis, we're really talking about amplitude versus angle analysis. AVO and AVA are interchangeable terms in the geoscience community. So if you've ever been confused by a paper that refers to AVA, it's actually the same as AVO. Now, this energy partitioning has been quantified. Here you see a diagram which shows an interface where above we have a VP, a VS and a density, and below a different VP and VS and density. So this would, for example, be a shale on a sand. And again, we have our incident P wave, but it's converting to a reflected P wave and a reflected shear wave. We also have a transmitted P wave and a transmitted shear wave. So a single pulse goes into the earth and four pulses come out. And what we'd like to do as geophysicists is quantify the amount of mode conversion, how much energy is reflected, how much is transmitted, and in what form. Is it a P wave or is it a shear wave? Well, this work was actually done over a hundred years ago by Karl Zurpritz. And in 1919, a posthumous paper was published by his co-workers, which included the solution for the partitioning of energy at an interface. On the left-hand side of the equation, you'll see a column showing RP, RS, TP, and TS. That is the reflected P wave, reflected shear wave, transmitted P wave, and transmitted shear wave. So those are the four elements that are created at that interface at the moment of transmission and reflection. That's what we want to find out. 
But in order to get that, look at the right-hand side of equation. There's a four by four matrix there, which is very complex. So if we had to solve that equation for every single interface in the Earth, it's going to take a very long time to do that, even with the advent of modern computers. So these complex equations have been simplified by many authors over the years. And here we see the two generic uh, references in terms of the AVO approximations. So the upper equation there, you'll see is R theta equals A plus B sine squared theta. Now those equations, you don't need to worry about too much because if you think back to your uh, secondary school or high school days, that is actually a linear regression, Y equals MX plus C. So the reflectivity at an angle theta is equal to the intercept plus the gradient times sine squared of the theta. So a linear regression is something we can very easily apply in geophysics. We can measure things off our seismic data now by just drawing a straight line through it. And it tells us about the true reflectivity at zero offset of an interface and this gradient term, how much that reflectivity changes with the angle of incidence. Now you'll see a second equation lower down which now has three terms, A, B, and C. So this is the three-term AVO approximation. So A is intercept, B is gradient, and C is something we call curvature, so C for curvature. At the base there, I've listed some other terms you might come across. RP, G, P and G, R0 and G, B0, B1, L and M. These are all the same as intercept and gradient. So again, if you ever see in a meeting or in a paper somebody referring to different coefficients here, don't worry. They're all the same as intercept and gradient. And quite often we see regional variation or company variation as to which of these coefficient references they tend to use. So you've got two equations and you may be asking now, well, when do I use these? Well, let's have a look. Here we see a graph with the reflection coefficient lifted on, listed on the left-hand side and the reflection angle on the horizontal axis. The black curve is the Zerpritz solution. That's that 4 by 4 matrix we looked at earlier. It's precise. It's the exact reflectivity we expect from an acoustic boundary. And you'll see that this blue curve, the Aki richards two-term approximation, follows that Zerpritz curve up to around about 30, 35 degrees. But beyond that, as we move towards the right of the graph, we're seeing a lot of divergence. And so the two-term approximation is not precise when we get to those higher angles. And that is why we then need to use the three-term equation. So for real seismic data, if you have long offset cable and high imaging angles, you may want to consider using the three-term AVR analysis rather than the two-term, which is valid in practical senses up to about 40 degrees reflection angle. Let's talk now about a little bit of the history of AVO and its development. Well, we mentioned earlier Carl Zerpritz in 1919 had his paper posthumously published showing the solution of the acoustic boundary condition for RP, RS, TP and TS. But actually, you can go back to 1899 and an author known as Knott who actually started to look at this acoustic solution problem. So we're going back to the end of the 19th century when these effects were of interest to people. But it wasn't until 1951 where people started to look again at how we might use seismic energy, so acoustic energy, to tell us something about the subsurface. And in 1951, Gassman presented a theory for the seismic velocity in porous rocks. So for an example, you might have a brine-bearing rock, so that says salty water, or you might have a gas-bearing rock, and he wanted to look at how those seismic velocities change. So you've got two components coming together there. One person's looking at rock data and seismic velocity, and another person is looking at the acoustic solution, the reflectivity from those rock interfaces. And in 1955, Kerford produced a paper that said AVO analysis, looking at this RP and RS, this mode-converted energy, could be used as a rock indicator. So he was building on the work of the previous authors. And specifically, he was looking at something called a VPVS indicator. So that's the velocity of P waves in a rock derived 
divided by the velocity of shear waves in a rock. And that can tell us about whether something is shaly or whether it's sandy, which is explorationists, obviously, we're very interested in. But then there's a gap of a quarter of a century. And so at the bottom of the slide, you can see there in 1980, we then see the next step change in AVO analysis. And Akin Richards developed that simplified form of Zerpritz's solution that we saw a moment ago. The reason they did that? Well, in 1980, computers are starting to be used in the seismic industry. And so there was application of the original research that had been done three quarters of a century beforehand. So we come to 1985 and things hot up a little. Castagno et al. at the Arco Rock Physics Group to find a background clastic trend for VPVS relationships. So what they were saying is, if we can look at the background, anything that stands out from it is anomalous and of interest to us. And then in 1987, George Smith and Morris Gidlow extended this idea and developed a depth-dependent background trend, which enabled them to generate a fluid factor attribute from seismic data. So the idea being that if we minimize the amplitudes in the seismic data of anything that's background, shales, brine-bearing sands, anything that stands out, gas-bearing sands, oil-bearing sands, might be of interest. In 1989, there was then a paper published by Rutherford and Williams, and what they were starting to do was say, OK, we can see all these events standing out from background, these anomalous AVO, AVA characteristics, but let's now try and classify them. And they developed the classic scheme that you will come across quite regularly, class 1, 2, and class 3 AVO attributes. In 1997, there was then an extension of this work by Castagna and Swan, and they took these types of attribute, these classifications of AVO attribute, and put them onto a cross plot. So we could then see the background trend, and we could see these events standing out in the intercept and gradient space, based upon that equation we saw a moment ago. And then in 1999, something very interesting happens. Pat Connolly from BP introduced the idea of elastic impedance. And that's the first time we really start to see us moving from the AVO reflectivity world, so just arbitrary seismic amplitudes, but we're looking at their relative differences, to a calibrated acoustic or elastic impedance world. And that's important because now we're starting to calibrate to well data. And if we can do that, we can predict porosity. We can potentially predict saturations ultimately. So that's why 1999 is a sort of key moment at which things change. And today, traditional AVO analysis is almost exclusively incorporated into seismic inversion. So when we talk about inversion of data, converting from reflectivity to layer-based rock properties is almost always based on AVO principles. And why do we do this? Well, it gives us then, instead of P-wave reflectivity and shear wave reflectivity, we actually get the P-wave velocity, the shear wave velocity, and the density of the rocks themselves. So we're going from reflectivity to rock properties. Rock properties is geology, and geology is where it's all at. That's what our wells are drilled on. So let's look at some simple models. Here we see, on the left-hand side, something I've referred to as tight. So this is a gas sand, but we filled up all the pore spaces so that there's very little gas in there. And uh, we've basically uh, cemented it up, so it's a tight sand. And you'll see from that little gather I've got there, so time is on the vertical axis and meters on the offset axis, there's very little change of amplitude with offset, so increasing offset to the right. But if we now change our model and we put in brine fill in the pore space, we get a brightening. So we've got some pore space, it's a soft rock now, soft top, hard base. We see this trough on the top, peak on the base, and the amplitude is fairly consistent with offset, not much brightening. Now we put in oil. Oil is a lighter fluid and it's more compressible. So we get a brighter seismic response. And then for gas, we get a brighter response still because the gas is much more compressible than the liquid. And this is what the P waves respond to. And there's also what appears to be an increasing AVO response, an increasing amplitude versus offset in this case because their offset gathers. Well, one of the things we like to do as geophysicists is generate attributes. And the reason for doing this is it gives us more resolution. So on the left-hand side, you'll see what we call a traditional reconnaissance AVO attribute. It gives us lots of information. It's easy to generate, but it's fairly low resolution. So on the left-hand side there, the left-hand figure, you'll see the green data there is our tight sand. 
but the brine case is now brown colour, a weak brown colour. And so the colour scheme here is telling us that green is decreasing AVO and brown is increasing AVO. And if we now go from brine to oil to gas, we get this significant brightening. So we've actually got an exploration tool now. We've done some modelling. We can now go and look at our seismic data and see if we see those characteristics. If it's green, it's of no interest to us. It's a tight reservoir. If it's brine, it's going to be low amplitude. But oil and gas will be really bright. But the problem we have with this image on the left is it's quite low resolution. So let's now look at the image on the right-hand side. In this case, we've incorporated this procedure known as seismic inversion. And one of the key aspects of it is it removes the wavelet from the seismic signal. That improves resolution. So the tight sand is no longer visible on this attribute, so it's blank, it's background. The brine sand is weak, the oil sand is slightly brighter, and the gas sand is very bright indeed. So again, we've got a nice exploration tool to go and look at our seismic, but incorporating inversion could either calibrate to our wells and give us real rock properties, but additionally, it's giving us this higher resolution. Now, these attributes on the left-hand side, again, this reconnaissance attribute is often referred to as the pseudo-gradient or restricted gradient. And you can generate this on your workstation just from a near and far stack. The AVO cube that I've referred to there on the right incorporates seismic inversion. It takes a little longer to generate it, but it is still just a near and far stack. So there's no horizons, no well data, it's a reconnaissance AVO product. So if you're going into a new ventures area, or maybe a very large 3D, two to 3,000 square kilometers, these are the attributes you might generate first, because they're quick and easy to do, in order to have a quick overview of your prospectivity. Well, here's some real data. It's a bit noisier than the synthetics you saw a moment ago. But this is what it looks like in the real world. This is a place called the Foynaven Field, which is offshore United Kingdom continental shelf, so a place called the West of Shetlands. And again, the colour scheme is the same. So this is the pseudo-gradient display, and the greens are decreasing AVO, and the browns are increasing AVO. And what you can see is we've got a couple of brown splodges there, which I've indicated with the arrows, which are increasing AVO. In this particular geological province, that's of interest to us. But what we'd like to do is see something that's slightly higher resolution. So if we incorporate inversion, what we now get is a much clearer, cleaner, and higher resolution image. And what I've done in this case is I've inserted a well log. So here we have the vertical line in there, the wiggle, is actually a gamma ray log. And gamma ray logs can tell us about how shaly or sandy a geological sequence is. So the kicks to the left there on the log are where the sequence is getting sandier. And I've indicated by the arrow the upper oil sand, which has a red signature associated with it, increasing AVO, and also the lower oil sand, which has a kick to the left, it's sandy, and it has a red signature, increasing AVO. If we go a bit deeper, we then see the brine sand. So this is the water wet sand, is indicated. It's very clear on the log, but there's nothing coming through on that seismic signal. So what we've got is a lovely calibrated tool that says we can now go and explore for oil elsewhere in this seismic volume, in this stratigraphic unit. And to the right of the image, you'll see I've got a question mark. It says gas cap. And that's later been confirmed that there is a gas cap evolved in this particular field. And you'll see it's brighter still. So not only can we distinguish brine versus hydrocarbons, qualitatively, at least, we can distinguish oil versus gas. OK, let's look at something different now. This is onshore. Now, onshore data is typically a lot noisier, but we can still do useful AVO and seismic inversion analyses. And what we're looking at here is a post-stack seismic volume. So often you'll have these delivered to you, and this is what you do your interpretation on. Now, hopefully what you can see on that slide is there's some sort of vertical lines running down. And you may think, is that some sort of noise in the image? Well, each of those vertical lines is actually a well. There's an awful lot of wells drilled through this field. And I've labelled on the top bar A39. So that A39 well, presumably the 39th well on the field, was actually drilled down to target the reservoir, which is the green horizon indicated as the F3 marker. And when it tagged that horizon, it found tight sand. 
So this is a producing oil and gas field, and yet for uh, producing well, they drilled a point and found tight sand. This had not been experienced here before. Now the A10 well to the right of that is purely shale bearing in the F3 sequence. So we know that somewhere in that zone, we've gone from good quality reservoir to tight reservoir to no reservoir. And this obviously had significant implications as to where you draw the next well. So we became involved in the study and decided to see if we could resolve this using AVO, rock physics and seismic inversion. So here's a cross plot. What am I looking at here? Well, I've taken four wells and I've taken the phi E log. So that's the effective porosity log. That's the pore space that we can get oil and gas and water in and out of. So that's on the left hand, the vertical axis. And on the x-axis on the horizontal, what we then see is impedance. So remember, that is the density times the velocity of a rock. And the colour coding there, shown on the right-hand bar, is V-shale. So the sands show up as a purple colour, and the shales and the ratty sands are more sort of the blue colours. So you can see the clean sand unit, as I've indicated, is this sort of cluster of purple values. So the high porosity values have sort of moderate impedance values and as it goes to lower porosity towards the right you then see higher impedance and that's great that's a classic porosity versus impedance trend as we'd expect in these sands the problem is though we're trying to isolate sands versus shales and if you look below those purple points you see all the other data so this is the shaley points so impedance on its own is not a good discriminator between sands and shales because high porosity sands are the same as the shales in terms of impedance and the low porosity sands are fairly similar to the shales in terms of impedance. So this is not the attribute we would want to generate using seismic inversion from our seismic data. So let's try another one. Here we again see phi E, the effective porosity on the vertical axis and something now VPVS which I alluded to earlier in the lecture which tells us about differences between sands and shales. And you see something really interesting now. If we look at the colour coding, remember our sands are these purple, clean sand units, and they all cluster to the left-hand side, below a value of around about 1.6, 1.65. Whereas the shales all cluster to high values of VPVS. So we can use this rock property, which we've measured in the well logs, to generate a seismic volume which is equivalent to this, a VPVS of volume, which hopefully will let us map those sands. Before we do that, let's do some modelling. Let's just see if there's an AVO effect or an AVA effect, as I should more specifically refer to it, that relates to that reservoir. And so what you can see here is some well log data, but then in the middle of the display is a synthetic. And I say AVA in this case because now my synthetic is no longer in the offset domain. It's in the angle domain. That's where we do all our amplitude versus angle analysis. And what we can see at the F3 marker is on the near angles, there's a peak which goes through a phase change to a trough. That's at the top of the reservoir. At the base of the reservoir, there's a trough becoming a peak. So we've got a nice increasing AVA response which seems to correspond to that sand reservoir. But we need to be careful and check whether that's just a fluid effect. And so some modelling was done and it showed that whether there's brine in there, oil or gas, you still saw this effect. So it's a utility of the seismic reflectivity we can use to map these sands. So there's the original image we had. This is the stacked response and the F3 marker, that's our Devonian sand, these are old rocks here, is shown in the lime green. If we now go to our VPVS or derivative Poisson's ratio plot where we've used AVO and inversion techniques to derive this, what you can see indicated is that we have that orange little slither of sand, the F3 sandstone I've indicated there, following all the way from the left hand side of the slide, drilled through lots of wells, okay, lots of good quality sands, and then it touches the A39 well and the sand just disappears at that point. So when that development well was drilled, they just tagged the end of that sand and we know that because when you get to A10, where it's all shaled out, there is no orange sandstone marker there. So you're now looking at a layered rock property. And this has then subsequently been used to map the sand around the field. 
So let's think now a little bit about the data that goes into all this analysis. Is the seismic processing important? Well, of course it is. And there are many processing procedures that can destroy that underlying amplitude response in seismic data that we're after. So what you have to do is rigorous amplitude QC carried out at key processing stages when you're dealing with any data set. And this could be something like when you've done a radon demultiple, okay, have you affected the primary reflectivity? And one of the ways we test this is we use our old friends, the two-term and the three-term AVO intercept gradient and curvature attributes. So we generate those for the data set before the process and the data set after the process and make sure we haven't destroyed or introduced any amplitude artifacts. But there's another key step in processing that we undertake, which is migration. How important is that, the type of migration we use? Well, two common subsets of migration are time migration and depth migration. And what are the differences between those two? Well, pre-stack time migration, referred to as PSTM, assumes that we have hyperbolic diffractions and we collapse those diffractions to their apexes. So the data, as acquired, has these diffractions from any reflecting point in the subsurface and we're collapsing those points back, regressing them back to their original point source. But if they're hyperbolic, these curves that we assume in the migration, what that means is they're only valid when the lateral velocity variations are mild to moderate. So if you have very distinct changes in the velocity, say you've got a salt, or you've got a fault, or you've got a floating carbonate in the system, then pre-stack time migration will fail. So we have to go to pre-stack depth migration, which does a correct shape diffraction modeling by ray tracing or wavefront modeling. And that is a much better approach for estimating the true travel paths of the reflectivity in the subsurface. So what we've done is we've compared data sets where they've been time migrated and depth migrated to see which gives a better result for AVO and inversion in different scenarios. Well, let's just look at a synthetic to start with. And what we're looking at here in the top left hand side, so image A, is the input model. And you can see there we've got some different colors there. That's indicating changes in velocity. And we've got a model of an incised channel feature, some little interbedded features in there. And what we want to do is see if we can recover that model. And what I'm most interested in is not only the shape, but actually the amplitude of each of those reflection events. So I want to get back to A after I've gone through my seismic experiment. So if we now go to B, so we move down to the lower image on the left-hand side, what you see is the result of shooting a synthetic on the model and then migrating it using pre-stack time migration. Remember, these simple hyperbolic collapsing of the diffractions. And we see that we sort of get a rough velocity model, similar to the original, but by far from perfect. And if you look at those seismic events on the lower part of the channel, they've almost disappeared. Some of them are in the wrong place, some of them are a bit wobbly, but you get this focusing, defocusing of the seismic amplitudes. Well, that's not good. We know the real model wasn't like that. So PSTM, time migration, has failed in this scenario. But what we can do is we can take that velocity estimate and put it into pre-stack depth migration imaging as our initial model. And so if we go to C now, which is the top right-hand side on the slide, we see that we've not changed the velocities, but we're now starting to image the amplitudes a little bit better along those layers. And if we update that pre-stack depth migration model using some sort of perturbation, some iterative approach, or even tomography, then you end up with the PSDM velocity result at the bottom, where we've recovered the initial model, apart from the lowest layer, because there's no deeper layer to migrate. We've also put the events back in the right position in space and time, and we've got the amplitudes back. So this little simple case demonstrates to you, albeit synthetically, that in a complex velocity scenario, time migration will not give you the right amplitudes, so you can't do good AVO and inversion, but depth migration will. So let's look at some real data now. Here we see some data, again from the UKCS, and the reservoir I've indicated to you is a high impedance zone. So what you see there, a little drilling rig picture on the top, there's a well log there, and that well log is acoustic impedance, P wave times uh, density. And the reservoir is a hard unit. So the color scale here on the right-hand side, hard events are purple, blue, soft events are green.
So if we look at the well log, we can see where that reservoir is. We now scan our eyes, left or right, to the inversion result. So we've taken the seismic, we've done some pre-stack inversion, which uses AVO, and we've come up with a prediction of impedance at zero offset. But the match isn't very good. We see that hard unit in the well, not really matching the seismic to the side. So something's wrong. What's, what's gone wrong here? Well, we've just used time migration here, and the geology is relatively complex, so maybe depth migration would do a better result. Here's the depth migrated image. So we've done exactly the same inversion procedure, just a slightly different wavelet and slightly different scalars, but everything else is exactly the same. And what we see now, quite excitingly, is that a hard reservoir in the well log now matches these units to the side. All right, there's lobes there. So around the well, there's a hard lobe, and then there's a soft unit, and if you work further to the left of the slide, you see a hard unit again. If we look at the geological model for this particular field, because it's understood from Fashi's analysis of the well log data, what you actually have, and I put a little image in the top left-hand side there, is a turbidite sequence running off a shelf, and you're getting these basin floor fans. So we're looking at fan lobe A, then an intra-fan lobe shale, and then fan lobe B. The pre-stack depth migration has not only positioned our seismic data in the right place in space and time, but it has also given us better amplitudes to give us a better inversion and a better prediction of the subsurface geology. So depth migration is the way to go if your velocities are good. So to conclude our little discussion here today on applied AVO, what we've actually covered is that AVO analysis is in fact AVA analysis, amplitude versus angle. And it relies on the seismic energy partitioning at a reflecting boundary. Now, the nature of this partitioning can tell us about the rock properties of the layer above and the layer below that interface. Knowing the rock properties can help us predict the lithology and fluid types that may be present and calibrated by rock physics studies. Correct processing of the seismic data also is key to our analysis. To finish off, I'd like to make some acknowledgements specifically to acknowledge the generosity of those who have allowed a priori publication of the material included herein. And specifically, I would like to thank the following for allowing me to present this short introduction on Applied AVO to you. Jagat Deo, who is the Managing Director of Seismic Image Processing Limited. And I've included below there for you some references for slides that have been used in this presentation. Thank you for your time.